Thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Becca McRae, and I am the district lead school nurse for Burlington School District. Um, and I just wanted to uh, put this event together because we have had some impact from vaping on our community. Um, and I think it's really important in order to combat vaping and other tobacco uh, products in our youth that we educate our community about their effects um, so that parents can continue the conversation at home. I do want to let you all know that we are going to be doing a vaping awareness day at both middle schools and the high school. Um, next Monday, the 27th, will be when we do it at Edmonds Middle School and the high school. And we still are trying to plan when we're doing it um, at Hunt, but all three of those days will be little tiny lessons for our middle and high school students about vaping and their effects on the body. So I'm really excited to partner with VCHIP, which is the Vermont Child Health, Health Improvement Program. 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 Sorry, I'm nervous. <laughs> um, and I also want to let you know that tonight um, is being videoed and shown live on our Facebook channel. And we are also providing interpretive services um, out across the district. So um, it may seem that our presenter is speaking slowly, but it's because there's literally live translation going on for our community that does not speak English. I'd like to um, just recognize that we do have two SAP counselors um, in our district at both middle schoolers, schools. Um, Angela Halstead is here tonight, and she's at Edmonds Middle School. Um, and Sunny Labdell is the SAP counselor at Hunt. Um, if you have any questions that come up, or if you and your child want to talk to them about vaping or vaping products, um, please email either of them. They're happy to meet with you or your child or both of you together. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker. Our speaker tonight is Dr. Ellie Ferrissey. She is a pulmonologist at the University of Vermont Medical Center, but she is also a parent in our district. Um, we are partnering with VCHIP um, in tonight's parent education um, series, we're trying to make a series for Vermont across different school communities. And so tonight is our first one and we're piloting it with Burlington. So thank you so much for being here and thank you so much for being here. And I'm hoping that the impact of tonight's education will be a positive outcome as we see use among teens go down in the next year. Awesome, Thanks. thank you, Becca. Um, all right, um, I am so excited to be here with all of you. Thank you so much for coming in person as we adjust to like actually being able to do this, which is really nice. So it's really nice to see families. Um, as Becca said, uh, I am Dr. Ellie Ferrissey. Um, I am a lung specialist, so I see children who have um, breathing issues who come to my clinic or in the hospital. Um, and that's really been my entry point into um, seeing a lot of tobacco-related effects and the effects of, of vaping on our youth. Um, I am also a parent of three kids in the Burlington School District who are in kindergarten and third grade uh, right now at the Integrated Arts Academy. Um, so uh, I'm going to go ahead and just get started. Um, I'm going to have Becca advance my slides. Okay, great. Um, so today I'm just going to talk about like what is actually out there with vaping products. We're going to get real basic about what they look like, what they are, what the components are, um, what we do and don't know about the health risks of vaping, and um, specifically there will be a lot of focus on nicotine dependence because that's one of the things that's really driving the use of young people's um, vaping habits and how this overlaps with mental health. Um, and then towards the end, we'll talk about how to talk to your kids about vaping, specifically around nicotine products, and then how to support young people um, who are interested in quitting vaping. Um, next slide. So uh, it's really important to say, like, who are we actually talking about here? Because a lot of conversations around vaping have this very um, kind of compared to cigarettes, they're not as bad approach. But when we're talking about young people, we're not talking about smokers. We are not talking about people who are current smokers who are trying to quit by using 
um, this switch over to e-cigarettes. That is not the population we're talking about. The comparison is, is vaping better than breathing clean air for these youth? Because these are kids who are not smokers. So just think about that in mind when, and whenever people are talking to you about, oh, it's not as bad as smoking. These are not smokers. And these are not necessarily young people who would become smokers anyway. Next. Oh, sorry. I'm going to try and be slower in my presentation. I'm sorry. Um, and then what we are going to talk about, um, nicotine containing vape products, uh, vape products that don't have any nicotine that are advertised as tobacco free. Um, and then briefly on cannabis, although I recognize this is an emerging concern. Next. So just to talk about what vapes actually look like, um, these first came out in um, 2007, 2008, and they were meant to look a lot like cigarettes, and they really don't anymore. So the second generation of uh, vapes have this kind of pen look to them. They have a battery on the bottom with an area for liquid, and then the top there is like what you inhale from. So this is the second generation. Next. Then the, the tanks or mods that are more handheld size, um, these tend to make very big aerosol plumes. Like if you're walking behind someone on the street and you see a big cloud, a lot of times it's this type of device that's being used. We don't see this as much in um, high school or middle school users because they're trying not to get caught. It's a really identifying way of using vapes. Um, next. And then the fourth generation, these are the ones that really changed the landscape for young people. This is the one in the top right is um, a Juul. So Juul came out in around 2015, and they have these reuse, re, um, replaceable mods that have some sort of um, e-juice in them with like, a, you plug it into that USB containing or like looking kind of drive. They look really sleek. They're easy to conceal. They don't make a lot of vapor. Um, and unlike cigarettes, which have a distinct kind of smell, these might just smell like whatever the flavor is. So it might smell fruity or sweet, and it might just be confused for a perfume or a body spray. It has a very different kind of smell if it's there. Um, so this is just a picture of different types of vape products where you can imagine if you saw this in somebody's backpack or purse, you might not be able to tell if this was a USB stick, a key fob, a smartphone case, some other tech piece of equipment. So they're pretty easy for young folks to conceal. Uh, this is a, just a diagram that's really simple about what's actually uh, the components here. So on the left is the area where there's a juice or a liquid that is um, around where you put your mouth to use this device. In the middle, the atomizing device is a metal coil that gets heated up to make that liquid um, an aerosol. And then the part on the right is a battery. So this is usually a rechargeable um, battery component um, that also has a, a risk of um, explosions. So that's one of the reasons they're not allowed on airplanes, just to let you know that. Uh, next. Uh, so the contents of the e-liquid, it usually has propylene glycol or vegetable glycerin in it some sort of flavoring, which for young people is often the allure or the hook of using it, usually nicotine in many of the products that are out there, uh, sometimes THC if it's a cannabis um, or marijuana containing product, and even vitamins, which is we'll talk about a little bit more later. Um, but these are the things that are on the label. And next, we care about what's not on the label, what's in there that we don't actually know about. Studies have identified that there's heavy metals in there. So the metals that are in that atomizing device get heated up, and then they end up in this vapor that ends up in people's lungs. Vitamin E acetate is a um, substance that was used to um, cut different THC products in um, kind of street preparations of cannabis vapes. And that was one of those substances that was linked to all those episodes of people going into the hospital with breathing issues that was related to vaping, if you guys remember that back in 2019. 
um, different oils, uh, and then any other additives, really, and then the and, and. There's just so much that we don't know about what's actually in there, because no one's really watching this industry and what's actually the contents of these e-liquids. So the takeaway from this slide is really that the, the aerosol that's produced from vaping is not just water vapor. And that's a really common misconception that young people think it's just water or just water vapor. But we know that it contains chemicals in it that have been shown to cause cancer. We know that the types of um, toxins that are in it are really, really small, and so they get very deep into the lungs beyond where the defense mechanisms of the lungs can kind of help keep them out. Um, there are heavy metals in it. Uh, there are flavors that are also um, irritants to the lungs, which we'll talk about um, soon. And then there's often nicotine in there, even if um, the label says that it doesn't contain nicotine. When they look in the lab, sometimes these products do, which is also very concerning. Uh, next. And next again. So going back to flavors, so the flavors are called generally recognized as safe by the FDA. And that is a term that's used for food additives. So these are chemicals that are made in a factory that are meant to be added to food, which when you eat them are safe. But they are not safe if you inhale them. And those are, that's a difference that is not often recognized, that, that these are really irritating to airways. They impact how your lungs can clear out infections. Um, and they're not regulated. So people often assume that when products are being sold that someone's watching to make sure that they're safe to use. And that is not the case with e-cigarettes. And people should really not be assuming that anyone is really paying close attention to what's in these products. Um, nicotine is a chemical that is really important um, because of its impacts on the adolescent brain. It's really um, involved in reward pathways, which we'll talk about. And it has an effect on concentration and learning um, for young people that seems like it probably does last in the long term um, that make those things more difficult. And it does act on blood vessels, so increasing blood pressure. Um, or for somebody who is pregnant, it could reduce the blood flow to the developing fetus, which is also something we haven't really gotten a lot of information about since these came out. Next. Um, the other solvents, the polyethylene glycol or glycerin, when they study these and look at what kind of proteins uh, it changes in the lungs, it causes things that are seen in COPD. So these haven't been around long enough to really study what happens when people are vaping for 10, 20, 30 years. Um, but in the lab, there are changes that suggest that, yeah, this could really lead to chronic lung disease down the line. Um, but we just haven't seen them in action long enough to have that data. Um, essential oils, so this is going back, we'll talk more about this soon, about just the, the vitamins or oils that are kind of part of a wellness um, idea, that those are really inflammatory in the airways too, so not a super safe thing to be inhaling. Um, and then cannabis uh, has been linked to, this, this word evali is um, what they were calling those episodes of being so sick with breathing issues that you had to go to the hospital. Um, many of those folks who were in severe respiratory distress um, had been using cannabis vapes, um, many of which were obtained on the street, um, and so it's really unclear exactly what it was that was causing those. Um, this slide is actually just to show that the, the way that nicotine um, has been delivered through vapes changed a lot when Juul came on the market. So if you remember back to high school chemistry, the pH scale makes things that are acidic and more alkaline on the right. And the way that cigarettes um, have nicotine is a pretty um, bitter and like not very pleasant thing to inhale. But what Juul did is they went to the lab and they made that nicotine a salt. So they moved how um, bitter it was, they moved how unpleasant it was, so that more nicotine could get into the body without it feeling unpleasant. And then you add a flavor on top of that, and the flavor hooks somebody, and then it delivers these high, high concentrations of nicotine without it feeling unpleasant. So that one of those little pods from Juul can have as much nicotine as a pack of cigarettes um, and get into the body in a way that doesn't really feel that bad for a kid right away. Next. 
Um, so this is kind of um, an interesting idea of just, just looking back at the last several hundred years of what cigarettes have looked like in the United States. So that big rise and that fall is about how many people are cigarette smokers in the United States. And the things I'll point out is when it was at its peak, that was 1964 when the Surgeon General said smoking is linked to disease. And it took all that time of people just gaining experience with what it looked like when everybody was smoking to get to that point where we say, ooh, we should probably try and curb this. And then it started declining because of a lot of public health efforts. People made policy changes. You couldn't smoke inside anymore. There were a lot of things that we did. There was the Great American Smoke Out to try to get people to stop smoking. Um, so that now it's fallen to probably about 14% of U.S. adults are smokers. So, but there's been a lot of effort to make this happen. And we don't have the experience right now to know exactly what e-cigarettes do to bodies. But we're on this trajectory, go ahead with the next one, where um, this is um, teenagers. These are high school students and what they're using. Um, I'll point out the brown line that says cigarettes um, that starts on the left at 31%. That was high school students using cigarettes in 2000. And that line just has a steep decline over the last two decades where pe young people were really not becoming smokers. They were not using a lot of cigarettes. And so that line is falling. And then you'll see that this red line comes on in 2015 when Juul becomes big. And those numbers of who's using e-cigarettes goes all the way up really fast. So 26% over a couple of years of that being out. So this is really appealing to people who run companies that are losing users over time, right? So a couple of years after Juul came out, the, big, the, the company that bought it was Altria, which is a big tobacco company. Um, so these companies have a lot of interest in getting young people to start using. They were losing this battle with policy changes. And I think our communities are really behind the ball about making policies that are preventing this same pattern from happening. Uh, next. Um, this matters because nicotine is really addictive. So this is a substance that um, is really profoundly impacting young people's brains. And the advertising that companies are using to describe it make it sound kind of benign. Um, they might have a product that says it's tobacco free, um, which might mean that it actually has nicotine, but the nicotine came from a lab. It didn't come from a tobacco plant. So it's technically not tobacco, but it is nicotine, or synthetic nicotine, which sounds kind of clean, right? But that also is just nicotine that's made in a lab. Um, heat not burn separates it from smoking a little bit more, right? So it doesn't sound like smoking. That can't be that bad then. Um, and then flavored nicotine pouches, I just put this out here so folks know that this is something that's kind of becoming more popular on young people. Those are the ones on the very top. Zinn is one of the brands. Um, and this is a pouch that's not inhaled, but it has um, nicotine in it. And so the, you're not getting the negative lung effects of having an inhaled nicotine, but you're still getting nicotine into the body and that's affecting the brain. Next. And nicotine is nicotine. Like even if you're not getting the lung effects, having that kind of rush to the brain um, is still going to impact that young person's brain. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Next. These uh, products are often designed to have really smart, um, tech-savvy kinds of um, designs that are appealing to young people. Um, and again, they have a ton of uh, nicotine delivery, which increases the risk of dependence. Um, so these really are affecting the adolescent brain. It's very exciting to think about what's going on in a teenager's brain. And I don't know, d d who here has teenagers right now? Yeah, OK. Exciting times. Um, they are, it's a great time to learn things. It's a really good skill building time. It's a great time to get good at a sport or take up a new hobby. And, and that has a lot to do with what's happening to the brain. The brain is going through this huge rewiring where the types of pathways that are used a lot get reinforced. So if you're teaching your brain that you feel really good after you go for a long run, your brain's like, I'm going to remember that. That made me feel really good. Um, and the, the pathways that are not used very often, your brain kind of starts getting rid of. Um, next. 
the, the double-edged sword part of this is that the teenage brain is really susceptible to um, the effects of addictive substances like nicotine or cannabis or alcohol. Um, and with nicotine in particular, um, what this does is it, it dumps a lot of a really good feeling chemical called dopamine and there's epinephrine as well. So it gives a rush, it gives a buzz that people feel really good about um, briefly. And then it's really hard to achieve that by going for a run or being on stage performing. It's hard to mimic that by doing things that aren't chemical based. And so one of the risks of this is that that person is teaching their brain that to feel this good, you have to get a chemical into your body to start feeling better. Next. Next. Um, so nicotine hacks into these different kind of reward circuits and it does it differently than it would for adults who start after their brain it has already gone through this kind of rewiring. So uh, we know that the earlier people start using nicotine products, the harder it is to break that dependence. So 90% um, of adult smokers um, are started smoking before they were 18 years old which is really telling that it's it's something that really grabs hold of people early on um, and we also know that e-cigarette users are more likely to go on to smoke cigarettes later in life and these are not necessarily the kids who would have started smoking cigarettes regardless so that's another kind of alarm signal for pediatricians and parents um, and I mentioned before that there, there is this predisposition to other substance abuse down the road because of that rewiring and what that person is teaching their brain about how to get pleasure and how to be feeling good. Next. Um, there are more long-term effects that are noted that have to do with attention um, and learning and memory. So how well people are able to focus and tune out distractions or um, retain things that they learn. Uh, it does seem like nicotine has a longer-term effect of that, even with people who use and then quit. So this is also a concerning kind of aspect of nicotine on the brain. And then, so that's the brain part, and really inhaling anything into your lungs is going to affect them in some way. Um, what I see in my practice is that the patients who I have who vape a lot have a really hard time getting over their colds in a regular amount of time. Like they might have a cough for weeks and weeks afterward. Um, they don't do as well with their sports, and they definitely have more asthma flares if they have a history of asthma. Um, I have seen a couple of severe illnesses requiring hospitalization as well. Um, this is a slide to just kind of make people aware about this other aspect of vaping that is not a nicotine containing push. And this is part of um, like a nicotine free push. So I found out about this because one of my 11 year old patients saw it on TikTok and asked her mom to buy her one of these. And she said, it's probably good for my asthma, right? Because it's got these essential oils in it and that sounds healthy. And if you look at that picture up on the top left, it does look pretty healthy. Like I, I could see seeing that and being like, this seems like something that's good to go into my body. It doesn't have nicotine in it. So what's the problem? Um, these definitely contain oils that are very inflammatory. Um, and then on the right side, uh, this is the same company, but this is um, advertising that's aimed at kind of the recovery community that says like, this is not a substance, this is not addictive, um, and it's more like having a cup of tea or doing something to relax yourself. Next. Um, so the culture of wellness is definitely getting its elbows into the vape world. Um, this, the vitamin vape is something where people are um, using this to get B12 into their lungs, which is not a proven way to be getting vitamins in, not recommended. Um, and then melatonin is another thing that people are starting to vape. Um, and none of these have addictive ingredients. Go ahead with the next one. But they are, they do still kind of promote this hand to mouth movement that is part of um, the experience of smoking or vaping that, that creates kind of a psychological script. Um, next. Um, and then they're kind of meant to be used regularly. So even if they don't have the addictive contents where the brain is getting hooked, there's an expectation that, oh, vitamin, you use that every day. You take that every day. Melatonin, you take it every night before you go to bed. And so there's this idea that you would do it regularly. And so it promotes that regular use. Um, 
And then many teenagers who are using e-cigarettes to vape nicotine are also vaping cannabis. Um, I expect that's going to increase further just as we have this more um, uh, like socially acceptable regulated market, even though the, the age for that is obviously over 21 years. Um, this definitely has the risk of developing severe lung disease. So even if you are using um, a product that's from a dispensary or from something that's medical grade, um, I think that's a really misleading name. It sounds like it's been studied like a medicine that should be safe to inhale, and it's not. This is not a good way to get um, cannabis into your body. If, if you are an adult who uses these, I would recommend finding a way to, to do that without inhaling it, either by smoking or vaping, because they really are um, impacting the lungs. Um, I have seen, so if, it, like if you look at the contents of what's on the ingredient list of places that do a lot of testing, it's, it's cannabis oil. So the oil part, again, very inflammatory. The lungs do not want that in there. Um, and I have seen cases of, of kids who get really sick, even though they're using products that have been fully tested and don't have the other stuff in them. Uh, next. Um, do folks have questions before I move on to nicotine? Is there anything in the audience people want to ask about the stuff we talked about so far? Can you talk about where kids get vapes? What's that? Where kids get vapes, what a great question. I would love also if you all know where kids get vapes to share that with me. Um, so there is a law in Vermont that you cannot buy tobacco products or vapes online. Um, that is a law that is not well enforced because I know that young people order them online. And I think that the it is not very hard to get around the age restrictions. Um, that is one way. People find them online and get them shipped here. Um, a lot of times people will um, get them from an older friend or a sibling who has bought them for them. Sometimes parents who don't know exactly what it is will just pick it up and say it's fine because their child has told them it's no big deal. Um, so um, I would recommend not buying these for your children if that's something that they ask you to do. Um, but that is one way that people are getting them. And there's a lot of um, sale at in social groups. So one person has a, a content where they're getting them from, and then they're able to sell that to their friends at a markup. That's what I've gathered so far. Um, other questions before I move on to nicotine? Yes. You look on the edge of your seat. Um, so it like, kind of depends on where you get them. One youth told me that they get them online for it costs 30 bucks a pod to buy it online, but then they buy it from a friend for 40 or 45, and that the pod would last them for like two or three days. Um, great question, and I think it varies widely with what the market is, because none of these, like you can't buy products under the age of 21 here from a retailer. Um, that might be happening and people might be lying about their age, but I think most kids are getting them from a, a system where there's a markup. So it might really depend on the culture of where they're getting them from. Are they working on regulating it better than they I would love to talk about that. Uh, y yes, <laughs> that would be a really um, helpful thing if that was enforced more regularly. Um, there is also right now a, a bill in the Senate um, or the state senate to do a comprehensive flavor ban um, on tobacco products, which includes um, all flavors, including mint and menthol. Um, so if you are motivated to call your senators and encourage them to pass that, that would be one way to try to affect policy change. Um, I think the one of the real approaches to kind of curbing this trend, it has to be very multi-pronged, but making these really unappealing and unaccessible um, are two big things, because kids do like find their way around things if they really want something, but taking away enticing flavors is a big part of making them unappealing. Um, I'll go on um, and talk a little bit about nicotine withdrawal. Um, so nicotine is a substance that even after infrequent use, um, it really does affect the brain where it makes the brain miss it. Like it wants to have nicotine around once it feels that really good feeling. And when it's not there anymore, 
people don't feel very good. A nicotine withdrawal is very uncomfortable. People get irritable and they're restless and they're jittery and they don't sleep well, but they're also tired and they have a hard time concentrating and then they might have an increased appetite and they have this real deep craving to use. Um, this is something that teenagers often experience anyway, um, and it has a lot of overlap with signs of anxiety and depression. Um, you can go to the next slide, or the next hit there. Um, they have, like many of these things, you can go to the next one, are signs of anxiety and depression that, pe that people feel, that it's hard to tease these out sometimes, and a lot of young people might be medicating those feelings by, by using, uh, because it does make them feel temporarily better. But what's tricky is how do I identify I'm feeling anxious or depressed and then I use my vape and I feel better. That's actually probably a sign of nicotine dependence and withdrawal. It's part of this cycle. And sometimes um, people need an outside suggestion that that is happening because they might not recognize it themselves, that, that, that the vape might actually be making those feelings worse because the treating it and feeling better is part of treating nicotine withdrawal. Next, uh, next. So that's what this cycle shows: is that um, that on the top you feel temporarily better after you're using. Um, there is a real tie with what situation you're vaping during. So if you're around friends, if you see people, uh, this happens in schools a lot, where people have a certain area or a classroom, or so they see someone who they often vape with, that, with, that they get this kind of trigger and it's an association that makes them kind of develop more of a craving when it happens. And then those pleasurable effects wear off. They start feeling stressed, they get an urge, um, and they feel like they can't feel normal unless they're vaping again, and so then they use again. So this cycle, um, it, it's a cycle that happens with many other drugs of dependence, but nicotine is one that um, young people often just don't think about or they don't expect that they're going to um, experience. Next. Um, so these are just some tips or suggestions around conversations with young people um, about vaping. Um, it's often really hard for teenagers to want to talk to their parents about stuff like this, um, and staying really non-judgmental is very important, and I think it's also really hard. <laughs> um, but trying to have conversations that are around activities that you're doing and not that don't have the feel of this big sit-down serious talk is one way to think about setting up that conversation. So it doesn't have to be a big thing every time. It could be kind of an ongoing conversation that's happening while there's some other activity happening. Um, ask open-ended questions, like see what is actually going on in their world with this and what they're noticing around vaping, like what's happening in their schools, um, what are they seeing online. I think that's a space that is really often pretty unsupervised and this is something that's all over social media feeds. Um, and then just ask, like, what do you think about that? Or what do you, what do you notice about um, what you're seeing online? Um, if you see ads with them, I think it's a really good exercise to talk about that with them and be like, what is this about? Like, do you notice that this person is a super young, attractive, healthy looking person? And like, what do you think they're trying to sell you? Or why are they using this type of a spokesperson to try to sell this? Um, and then what, you know, what's the response from your school? Like when your, kid, when your friends got caught vaping, like what happened to them? And what about your friend group? How did they respond? And just kind of getting a sense of what the culture in their social scene is. Um, and then is anyone getting in trouble? Is anything bad happening to them in, in their um, lives because of vaping? Next. And then if you want to make it like more personal about them, do you just ask them, like, have you ever tried it? And like, what did it feel like? And actually, like, the, the remaining non-judgmental has a sense of curiosity to it, of just like try to stay curious about like what was this person's experience in doing this? How did it make you feel? Um, and then it, what did it do to your mood? Did you feel, did you, how did you feel during? What about in the hours or days afterward? And this is a good chance to do like a little bit of a mental health check-in with them about like were you, was anxiety part of this for you or were you feeling really down? Um, and what was the effect of, your, of vaping on that? Um, and that can kind of help to figure out too if they're self-medicating or if they're, if they're having any of those symptoms of nicotine withdrawal. Um, and then trying to get them to reflect too, if they are using something, if they are vaping, like what do you think has changed in your life since doing this? Like have you noticed a change in how focused you are in class? Have you noticed a change in what you're interested in or what you're talking to people about? Um, what about uh, your sports performance? And 
this is the, the parent in of just being like, one thing I've noticed is, and then leave it. <laughs> and see what the response is, um, if there's something that you've noticed. And then talking specifically about the products is helpful too, just to model that people really should know what they're putting in their body. Like, what is in what you're using? And how do you know that that's what it is? Which might give you an insight into where they're getting it from too. If they're like, I don't know, it didn't come in a package or this person made the e-juice, you know? Um, and how do you know what's in it? And then um, if you don't know what's in it, why not? Like, why is that okay with you to be inhaling something that you have no idea what you're putting into your body? It's a good conversation starter of like really taking care of um, this body because you get one of them. Um, and then you can ask if it's okay with them if you share some of the stuff that you learned about here um, or if they want to have more of that conversation. Uh, the other important thing is to figure out where they're getting information from. So you don't have to be the only place they go to um, for information. You're probably not. Uh, but the online world is like big and broad and very full of misinformation. Um, so I would recommend uh, pediatricians are a great place to uh, talk about this with if you have um, concerns about how if your teen has a um, issue of dependence, for sure. Um, the, all of these websites have parent pages, which are really helpful and have a lot of information on them. So um, the smoke-free teen website here on the bottom right has a lot of vaping-specific information. The Truth Initiative has both um, uh, youth and parent pages. And then same with My Life, My Quit, which is a Vermont Department of Health-based platform that also has a lot of quitting resources on it. Um, and then don't forget your school. Like your school has a school nurse, it has counselors and SAPs, and it has teachers who care about your kids um, and would be good people to connect with over this if you have concerns about what's going on. Next. Uh, okay, this is my last slide. This is the bottom line. Um, anything that you inhale into your lungs is going to have an effect on them and really not recommended to do, use anything that is not prescribed to you. Um, just because we don't know all the risks of vaporized products doesn't, it does not mean the same as having no risk. Nicotine is really powerful for the teenage brain and these kind of symptoms of nicotine dependence do have a lot of overlap with mental health issues. Um, for kids who are not smokers, which hopefully is most of them, uh, vape products that promote frequent or daily use are going to be more dangerous than those that don't. So anything that has an addictive ingredient is going to be more harmful than those that don't. Uh, but anything that has daily recommendations or routines around it are also um, uh, a risky thing to start. And then um, keep looking for more support if you think that your child has a dependence on, on any of these products. Um, and then policies do really matter. Like all of the successes that we've had around tobacco and cigarette smoking and making those unappealing and unavailable to young people were the result of policy changes that changed culture. Um, and so get involved with things like, think about how our community approaches these things. We are like, really behind <laughs> on addressing um, these problems, and I'm sure that those who are here are aware of that. Um, but the getting involved in at the community level um, with local and state legislation and policies is um, going to be where we make some impact. And that's all I have. If you can go back, that's the last one. OK, cool. That's, that's what I wanted to talk to you folks about today. Um, thank you so much for coming. And I am happy to take other questions that are here from the audience or from, from Facebook. I don't know if there's any, is anyone monitoring the feed? No, oh, no one's monitoring it. Sorry, everybody. Um, we do care about your questions. Uh, <laughs> do an FAQ. Just tell them that. What are we doing? An FAQ. Frequently asked questions. OK. Anyone in Hunt Auditorium have comments or questions? I blew your socks off. Nothing to say. All right, well, thank you very much for your time, everybody. And I'll be around for a little bit longer if anyone wants to come up. Oh, nice. I'll stand next to you on the other side. So, you have the mic. so thanks for coming. Um, I just wanted to also let you know that one of the reasons that we did this program is because we have had adverse effects of students using vape for the very first time. 
due to peer pressure, and they end up in the school nurse's office, and then they end up at the ED. So it is really important to talk to your kids about vaping, um, and if they're using, like Ellie said, be non-judgmental and try to come at it from an informational standpoint, but also let them know that this is really serious and can land them in a place that they never expected to be um, and that you as a parent never want them to be. Um, so we're here to support you. The school nurses are a place you can reach out to. The SAP counselors are a place to reach out to. I'm hoping to have the materials that we're going to be showing and the classes in the middle school and high school sent out through the parent newsletter um, next Friday is when most of them go out, not this Friday, but next Friday. So be on the lookout for those too and you can talk to your kids about, hey, I noticed that they showed this in class. What did you think about this or what did you think about that? So we are going to try to give you those pathways to start talking to them at home as well. So thank you so much for doing this amazing presentation and thank you all. Oh, a question. Yay. So I'm just going to repeat the question for the people on the Facebook feed who can't hear you. Um, so uh, the question is that um, kids are telling parents about use in the bathrooms, uh, vaping in the bathrooms, and is there any monitoring system to this? Obviously, it's a really hard thing to monitor. So um, yes, there are monitoring systems out there, but um, we do not have them yet. So I'll give you an example. So Milton High School installed a vaping alarm in their bathroom. And um, also part of, part of public health in general is you don't want whatever the alarm is going off to be punitive to people, otherwise they're never gonna change their behaviors um, for themselves. So um, the Milton School District decided that instead of it being punitive, anyone who was in the bathroom when the alarm went off, and the alarm that goes off is a silent alarm that goes to an administrator to piece of technology. So the administrator then goes to the bathroom and collects whoever's in the bathroom. And um, they have a non-punitive thing that whoever's in the bathroom, they're not looking for who's vaping, they're not looking for who's at fault. They're looking to educate whoever was in the bathroom at the time. And so what they do is they provide an online learning module from Stanford University for those teens to really deeply understand what vapes do to your brain and to your lungs. Um, and it has had positive effects this year on some of those users. Um, they've had a lot of uh, students uh, go through that education and it opens parent conversation, it opens the will to quit um, if they are using, and this actually spurred part of the VCHIP project that Ellie is a part of, um, where the local pediatrician's offices are trying to bridge with school nurses to help support those students who want to quit. Um, so that they're more successful. As Ellie has seen in her practice, there are a lot of kids that want to quit, but it's a lot harder than they ever imagined it would be. And I think that's the message that they really need to learn before they start using, is they really need to start. One of the things that made tobacco go down was the education that users were coming bravely forward to share with people who hadn't yet started. And so it's, we know that the preventative education is the number one way to prevent new users. Um, and so that's just a little bit. But to answer your monitoring question, we do not have those monitoring alarms in our schools. Um, but again, I think we could team with PTOs and we could create a community of people who could figure it out together, both from the school district side and from the parental side, so that it's not punitive, that it is educational, that it is a partnership, and that it is successful. Um, so you don't ever want to put something into place that is too soon or people don't really understand it. So I think that that's probably our next step as a community is trying to figure that all out together. More questions, yay! Just a, um, just a comment to piggyback on what you just said. Oh, 
her talk into this? Or? You might want to come up and talk. So Angela Halstead, the SAP counselor from um, Edmonds Middle School, is going to piggyback onto what I just mentioned. I was not expecting that. That's right. Just here on. You have to stand right here. Right. Okay. okay. Hi. <laughs> so I'm an SAP counselor, and I work at Edmonds Middle School. And because I'm at the middle school, um, I see any student for any reason. So kids come and talk to me about anything. Um, but on a side note, as well as Sunny Lobdell, who works here, who's an SAP counselor here at Hunt, um, we are also drug and alcohol counselors. So our jobs are also to educate and support kids that are caught using. But in, to piggyback off of what you were talking about, um, our biggest monitor sometimes are the kids themselves. Mm -hmm. And so building rapport with the kids, you know, I have kids, students come and talk to me because um, they're really worried about their friends or they've noticed somebody's vaping or they're just scared knowing that that's happening in our community. Um, and then I can keep their name confidential and then I, I can reach out to that other student and say, hey, you know, you know, some people are talking about you vaping and we're really worried about you. And oh my goodness, nine out of ten times kids are super honest. And it is, it's a health and wellness issue. It's not a, I'm going to lock you up and <laughs> throw away the, you know, it's like we are really, really worried about you. Um, and through all these reports, thankfully, in the past like month, students have been like, you know, quitting. Like, I'm not doing that anymore. Or I did it for fun, or I was curious, but I've stopped. And now I'm helping my friends quit. So the peer-on-peer -peer influence is huge. So if kids are coming and telling you that people are vaping, encourage them to report it. Um, it's, it's the best way to get them help. Um, and then these monitoring systems, there is you know, definitely a success around those as well. Because from our lens, too, the more kids that get caught, the more kids will get help. So I think with vaping, like Dr. Ferrisy was talking about, it is a sneaky business. So that's where we're up against a lot here. It's not smoking a cigarette that really, you know, it smells and it's really obvious. I mean, kids can hide it, they can vape wherever, and it can smell like lotion or... Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm glad you brought that up because kids are like our, our number one monitors. <laughs> um, and at Edmonds, we also have a, a prevention group called Be Above. And this year, we just have kids like joining left and right. And some kids are just joining to keep themselves safe because they feel like if they're a member, then that's an excuse not to use. So that's pretty cool. And we just do like school-wide projects, like we're gonna partner with um, Becca here on the vaping awareness activities that are gonna come out. And so we do different things in our building to create, you know, yeah. just create awareness and education. So, yeah. So thank you so much. <laughs> Did you have a question? Yeah. Thank you. The question was what the different modalities are to help teens and preteens quit using. Um, I'm, I'm going to speak to nicotine. Was that your question, Focus? So there are not good data to guide pediatricians around what to do with this. Um, we, we prescribe nicotine replacement therapy for young people. Um, it's off-label use, but it is a tool that we have. Um, I honestly don't think I have a lot of success stories of it. I think it's really hard. Um, nicotine replacement is not a magic pill. It makes quitting less uncomfortable, but it's still very uncomfortable. Um, and I think that the process of quitting is frustrating and withdrawal is real. And it helps for teenagers to have a lot of wraparound support. So the people who I've seen quit successfully, who are pretty dependent, have had 
a substance use specific like counselor who works with them on it. They've had success uh, or support from their parents who are very much invested and aware and supportive. Um, and people know that they're in the process of quitting. They've told their friend group about it. And so they're asking for this kind of outside accountability. Um, and they have done things like making a quit plan because I think that that's also, um, that's something that you can walk through on the, the Smoke Free Teen website. It has one where it kind of walks through like, really, why do you want to quit? What are the reasons? What's your motivation? What are you going to do when you get cravings? And it's a lot of anticipation of how to handle the stress and discomfort that comes with quitting. Because that part is, when you know what's coming, you're re more ready to deal with it, I think. But um, it is n not an easy <laughs> process. And I think that's the other thing that's really motivating me to try to really focus on prevention, because this is a substance that I, it, the addiction sneaks up on kids. They don't think that they're going to get addicted, and then they try to quit, and they can't. And then I have seen kids who they're like, yeah, I started vaping when I was 13, and I just still do it because I can't stop, and they're you know, 17 or 18 when I see them. So like, it's just been building for people for a long time um, who may not have been seeking support early on. Um, and I think that's a, a, another really big signal to me that we really need to be focusing on the prevention side, because the, the truth treatment side is like really resource intensive, it is hard, <laughs> and it's not, it doesn't have great outcomes. I'm really excited to hear Angela say that, that, that there have been folks who have in your school system who are quitting with support from their peers, um, because I just haven't seen a ton of success with people who are trying to quit, and they do. Um, I, I do think the peer connection and like near peer education has a lot of potential to be helpful, and I and that's something I think that the district should consider doing too. Of folks who um, have uh, quit and why they did, and talk to younger grades about it, or do it just like that. This is what happened to me, and like I didn't think it would, and that did. Like I think it's really powerful coming from other people that they know. Um, I'm like really not into the scared straight dare kind of approach of things, um, but I do think that having the input from peers who have experienced things as powerful for people. Um, any other questions? Sorry, the question was about um, how different different types of vapes do or don't make a big aerosol. Um, and it has to do with how the diff different vapes have different levels of heat <laughs> and how long you push and how long you inhale that changes the way that things are aerosolized. So yes, there are more subtle ones that, um, that you can just do without creating a lot of identifying visible plumes. So you just be walking down the hall and nobody would Yes, and you should watch when you're walking downtown, you will see people doing this too. Like you, it's just a, and you don't have to, there's no start or end to it. You can just take a puff here or a puff there and then just do it all day. It doesn't, it's not like with a cigarette, there's an end. You reach an end of a cigarette and then you're done. It's just that you've got this thing that you can, you know, just like sip on all day, basically. In your pocket? You put it in your pocket. There are kids who, um, you, uh, no, um, it, it, not, it shouldn't be hot. Um, <laughs> but they, people do, um, like, Kids will use it through their sweatshirt or through a hood. It can go through fabric. Like there's just, it's so stealthy um, that again, speaking to what Becca was saying, it's not the the like catching and monitoring of that is not going to be a real successful approach to this. It's too, it's too um, under the radar. And the and the companies that make these have made them really sneaky. Like one of them looks like a little tiny Game Boy like a little Nintendo Game Boy um, like video game. So it's just, they are very sneaky and kids can use them without any adults knowing what, what the, what's going on, um, which I think is one of the scarier parts is that they, so this is why we're doing this educational um, kind of drive. Um, I do also want to just point out that this is not a middle or high school issue. It is also an elementary issue. We have had fifth graders bring vapes to school and share them with their friends like, hey, look at this. I got it from my older brother or older sister, and isn't this so cool? And luckily, we have adults in the building because fifth graders are a little bit more honest and a little bit more innocent. And so they will share that information with adults, and then they can have the conversations around, well, this is actually something for adults, and um, it's dangerous for your brain. And, and so 
luckily, in those instances where the fifth graders are bringing it to school, it becomes an educational turning point and opportunity um, where uh, they just decide not to start doing that because their teachers have told them that it's not okay for their bodies. So I do I think that, that it, it would be naive of us to think that this is a certain issue at a certain level. It's definitely all across our age span um, that we need to be educating. Any other questions? All right, so like we said, we'll be doing an FAQ from all the questions that come up on Facebook. Um, so if you're watching this on Facebook after the live feed, please do put your questions in the comments um, and we will do our best to do an FAQ. And otherwise, look for those resources that are going out uh, for the middle and high school kids that will be doing the educational day that will go out in the parent newsletters. Um, and um, Angela and Ellie and I will be in the back if you have any other questions that you were shy and didn't want to talk in front of the whole group. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. All right.